Welcome to this educational program. This module discusses a particular type of treatment for prostate cancer called cryoablation. There are other modules available that provide an overview of prostate cancer and discuss other treatments in greater detail. This information is taken from a recent review of the medical literature and attempts to be as comprehensive as possible. However, it may not necessarily reflect the experience of your healthcare provider or the specifics of your situation. This program is strictly informational in nature, and no attempt is made to provide opinion or recommendation. Please feel free to view this presentation as many times as necessary. You may also use the player on your left to repeat slides or to skip through them in any order you wish. Prostate cancer is the uncontrolled growth of gland cells in the prostate, a small gland just below the bladder that surrounds the urethra or urine channel. This common cancer is detected most commonly by the prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, blood test and digital rectal exam, or DRE. The diagnosis is confirmed by a biopsy, which allows doctors to look at the prostate cells under a microscope. The treatment for prostate cancer depends on the stage or extent of the disease, and different options may be considered for different stages of cancer. In general terms, prostate cancer may be considered localized or organ confined when it is felt to be entirely contained within the borders of the prostate, locally advanced when there is suspicion or evidence that it has escaped through the capsule of the prostate or into nearby structures, recurrent when it has previously been treated and then come back, and metastatic when it has spread to other parts of the body away from the prostate. Cryoablation, also called cryotherapy, is a treatment for prostate cancer that uses extreme cold creating ice that destroys tissue. It was approved as a treatment for prostate cancer by the American Urological Association in 1999. It is not available in all centers, but the number of centers offering it is steadily increasing. Cryoablation may be considered in a number of situations. As primary treatment for localized cancer, it is, as mentioned, an emerging treatment available at some centers. It is also a recognized treatment for recurrent cancers after radiation treatment, as so-called salvage therapy. It is not a good option for very bulky tumors. Patients who might be suited for cryoablation are those who are fit for minor surgery and who have no evidence of metastatic cancer, a PSA level less than 20, any Gleason score, and a prostate smaller than 60 grams. Most men with prostate cancer will have been seen by a urologist, a surgeon who specializes in the urinary system and the male reproductive system, who will determine the patient's eligibility and suitability for cryosurgery and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the procedure. The patient is usually given a preoperative assessment one to two weeks before surgery and will be required to fast, meaning not eat or drink anything, for several hours before the operation. Following this, you will be asked to sign informed consent for the procedure. This is a very important document which indicates that you understand why the treatment is to be performed, other treatment options, what surgery entails, and what the potential risks are. The consent also allows your doctor to perform any other procedures that are deemed necessary to save your life, and to use the assistance of other medical personnel, such as other doctors, nurses, technicians, and students. Prior to surgery, you may meet with an internist or an anesthesiologist to precisely determine your fitness for the procedure. This appointment may involve an interview, examination, blood tests, a cardiogram, and possibly other special tests. With all of this done, it is time to prepare for your procedure. In the days leading up to it, focus on living as healthy as you can, eating a balanced diet, and getting some regular exercise. Gathering the support of friends and family around you, as well as other patients who have had cryoablation done, when possible, can help ease your mind and comfort you. Try to take other measures to reduce stress as well. Arrange time off work well ahead of time and organize some help with household and other tasks before and after treatment. Learning about your condition and your therapy through programs like this can also help to relieve anxiety by removing the mystery of what is happening to you. Finally, it is important to understand and come to terms with the expectations of treatment as well as the potential outcomes. The night before the procedure, Eat a light meal, then take nothing by mouth for several hours before surgery. A common instruction is to take nothing by mouth after midnight on the night before the operation. However, individual instructions will vary. 
you may be advised to perform a bowel prep the day before surgery, such as drinking a special fluid to clean out your bowels. Try to get a good night's sleep, as it helps to go into surgery well rested. Finally, as individual situations will differ, follow the advice of your doctor or hospital regarding specific preoperative instructions. On the day of surgery, have someone drive you to the hospital or clinic and try to arrive early. You will likely first go to the admitting department and have some paperwork done to check you into the hospital or clinic. You will then be checked into the surgical area, where you will change into a hospital gown and meet with a nurse. The nurse will review your medical history and check your vital signs, including your blood pressure, pulse, and temperature. An intravenous, or IV line, will likely be started, through which you will receive fluids and later medications. An enema is given in some centers where the bowel prep is not taken the day before. At some point during this process, you will meet with an anesthesiologist who will administer anesthetic drugs and monitor your vital functions during the treatment. The anesthesiologist will review different anesthetic options with you and discuss their merits and potential risks. Finally, prior to beginning the procedure, you will meet once more with your surgeon and any final concerns can be addressed. Once in the operating or treatment room, an intravenous or IV line will be started if not done already. You will then be put to sleep by the anesthesiologist and a breathing tube will be introduced. Alternatively, you may be given freezing medication in your back which numbs the body from the waist down. Finally, you will be positioned on the operating table with your legs up in stirrups and your skin will be cleansed with an antibacterial solution. As shown here, a catheter or tube is introduced into the bladder through the urethra and an ultrasound probe is inserted into the rectum to visualize the prostate. Careful measurements of the prostate are taken and the number and location of the needles is planned out. As shown in this diagram, under the guidance of ultrasound, a temperature probe is passed through the perineum, the skin between the scrotum and anus, into the space between the rectum and the urethra and prostate. Temperatures are monitored throughout the procedure with thermal sensors and care is taken to ensure that the urethra and rectum are kept warm. This diagram also shows how the long thin cryoablation needles, about 2 millimeters thick, are passed through the perineum into the prostate, again under the guidance of ultrasound. Finally, as shown here, a second catheter, called a suprapubic catheter, is placed into the bladder through the skin of the lower abdomen. This will act as a safety mechanism to provide bladder drainage in case there are difficulties urinating after the procedure. Cryoablation involves inserting these long, thin needles into the prostate through the skin between the scrotum and anus, called the perineum. Very low temperature argon gas circulates through the needles and freezes the prostate tissue to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Helium gas then replaces the argon and thaws the tissue. This freezing and thawing process is repeated once more and the cancer tumor and its blood supply are destroyed. The procedure takes about two hours and patients either go home the same day or spend one night in hospital. It is usually okay for the patient to eat supper the same day of the procedure and most times he will need to stay overnight in hospital. Most men are fine to go home the next day as cryoablation is not a painful procedure. Since it is important that a patient take it easy for a couple of weeks after surgery, it may be a good idea to find someone to assist with daily activities. Many patients can resume most normal activities in less than a week. After surgery, some patients may experience temporary bruising and swelling. It is common to have difficulty urinating for two to three weeks after the procedure. Therefore, as mentioned, a suprapubic catheter is placed into the bladder through the lower abdomen to drain the bladder if necessary. Your doctor will instruct you on how to use this catheter. After a period of time, you will begin to clamp this tube off and urinate on your own. Then unclamp the tube to drain the remainder and check to see how well you emptied on your own. When these so-called residual volumes drop to a certain level, indicating that you are safely emptying your bladder well, your doctor will remove the suprapubic catheter or teach you how to do it. It is also not uncommon to have a slow urine stream and or frequent urination for two to three months after cryotherapy. About 5% of cryoablation patients will experience mild stress incontinence or urine leakage. Erectile dysfunction, or ED, the inability to have or maintain an erection, is a much more common side effect occurring in all patients initially. Recovery of erectile function, however, occurs in about 50 to 60% of patients over one to three years. 
Fistula formation, which is a hole connecting the urinary tract and the rectum, is very rare and more likely for salvage procedures, where cryoablation is done after previous radiation treatment. There have been no reports of death following this procedure. Follow-up visits after cryoablation include regular visits to your doctor and PSA tests, typically every three months after treatment for the first year, every six months for another couple of years, and annually thereafter. Individual situations may require different follow-up plans and your doctor will outline your specific follow-up. Regardless, PSA levels should fall to almost zero and remain less than 1.0 nanograms per mil following cryoablation. Follow-up biopsies or sampling of the prostate tissue may also be performed to confirm that treatment has been successful. Should cryoablation treatment fail or should cancer recur, meaning come back, other therapies may be offered, such as repeat cryotherapy, radiation therapy if not already done, hormone therapy, or occasionally salvage prostatectomy, meaning surgery to remove the prostate. The success of cryoablation, like other treatments, depends on an individual's risk category. Patients are divided into three broad categories, low risk, medium risk, and high risk, depending on the chances that their prostate cancer has already spread beyond the confines of the prostate at the time of diagnosis or treatment. Risk is based on a patient's PSA value, the grade of the tumor, and the stage of the tumor. As shown in this table, a low risk cancer is indicated by a PSA of under 10, a Gleason score of 6, and a stage of T1 or T2A. A medium risk cancer is indicated by a PSA of 10 to 20 or a Gleason score of 7 or a stage of T2B. Finally, a high risk cancer is indicated by a PSA of greater than 20 or a Gleason score of 8 to 10 or a stage of T2C or greater. Cryoablation has been considered an emerging treatment because good long-term data has not previously been available but this data is now beginning to be reported. It appears that for low-risk cancer, cryoablation has similar success to all other standard prostate cancer treatments, with 60 to 90 percent of patients showing no evidence of disease at 5 to 10 years after treatment. For medium-risk cancer, cryoablation is at least as good as other treatments, with 45 to 90 percent showing no evidence of disease. And for high-risk cancer, cryoablation may be the best treatment option with 35 to 75 percent of these challenging patients free of cancer over the same time period. There are several advantages to cryoablation. It is a less stressful procedure than surgery and offers a good alternative for older or less fit patients. The hospital stay is short, there is minimal pain afterwards, and the recovery is quick. It is an effective treatment option compared to other treatments. It can be repeated if necessary and it can be used to treat patients with recurrent cancer after radiation with excellent long-term results. Because cryoablation of the prostate is still a fairly new procedure, more long-term results are needed to fully evaluate its effectiveness. Surgical results following cryoablation will vary with the skill and experience of the surgeon, and the rates of resulting erectile dysfunction are high. The incidence of serious side effects is higher when cryotherapy is performed for recurrent cancer after radiation. To summarize, cryoablation of the prostate is a surgical technique that uses extreme cold to destroy prostate cancer tissue. Needles filled with circulating argon gas are used to freeze the entire prostate. Surgery takes only a couple hours. Patients may go home either the same or the next day, and they may return to normal activities fairly soon afterwards. Results of cryoablation treatment vary depending on the situation, and more long-term studies are needed to clarify this. Risks include swelling, difficulty urinating, incontinence, and erectile dysfunction. In most cases, cryoablation is comparable in effectiveness to other standard prostate cancer treatments. These are just a few of many online resources available to educate you on prostate cancer and help you find support. There are also many books written specifically for patients with prostate cancer, and this is just a sample of a couple. These may be available at your local medical library, bookstore, or prostate center. These modern references were used to assist in preparing this presentation. These references were also used. All of these are available for review at your local medical library, prostate center, or the internet. 
should you wish to do more reading on this subject. We sincerely hope that this module has furthered your understanding of cryoablation for prostate cancer. We wish you the best for the future, and thank you once again for viewing this educational program.